In the heart of one of London's most infamous criminal cases, lies a tale that has baffled investigators, and captivated the minds of many for over a century. A tale shrouded in mystery, this true crime saga unfolds within the intricate corridors of the past, where science and justice intersect in riveting yet contentious ways. At the heart of the narrative lies a question that still echoes through the corridors of time, did Crippen, a seemingly unassuming man, truly commit the heinous act he was accused of, or has history played a hand in obscuring the truth? Holly Harvey Crippen, born in Coldwater, Michigan, emerged as the lone surviving child of Andres Skinner and Myron Augustus Crippen, who worked as merchants. Crippen's educational journey led him initially to the University of Michigan Homeopathic Medical School and culminated in his graduation from the Cleveland Homeopathic Medical College in 1884. Tragedy struck when his first wife, Charlotte Jane, passed away from a stroke in 1892. Following this, Crippen entrusted the care of his son, Holly Otto, to his parents, who resided in San Jose, California. Armed with his qualifications in homeopathy, Crippen initiated his practice in New York City. The year 1894 marked the start of his second marriage, this time to Corinne Cora Turner, a music hall singer who graced the stage under the name Belle Elmore. During this period, Crippen began his association with Dr. Munyans, a homeopathic pharmaceutical company. In 1897, Crippen and his wife relocated to England, although his medical credentials from the U.S. did not grant him the ability to practice medicine in the United Kingdom. While Crippen continued his work distributing patent medicines, Cora became immersed in the social circles of prominent variety performers, including Lil Hawthorne and her husband-slash-manager, John Nash. In 1899, Crippen faced dismissal from Munyans due to excessive attention spent on managing his wife's stage career. He transitioned into the role of manager at Druitt's Institution for the Deaf, where in 1900, he brought on a young typist, Ethel Leneve. As time progressed, a romantic relationship developed between Crippen and Leneve, eventually evolving into an affair by 1905. Amidst residing at various locations across London, the Crippens eventually settled in 1905 at 39, Hilldrop Crescent, Camden Road, Holloway. Here they supplemented their income by taking in lodgers. Complexities arose in their relationship, when Cora engaged in an affair with one of these lodgers, prompting Crippen to embark on his own extramarital involvement with Leneve in 1908. Following a gathering at the Crippen residence on January 31, 1910, Cora vanished without a trace. Crippen asserted that she had returned to the United States, and later amended his statement to claim that she had passed away and been cremated in California. In the meantime, Leneve took up residence in the Crippen household, and began appearing alongside the doctor in public, adorned in Cora's jewelry and furs. The initial notification about Cora's disappearance came from her acquaintance, the strong woman Kate Volcana Williams, however the situation escalated in significance when Nash and Hawthorne, close associates of Scotland Yard Superintendent Frank Frost, urged the police to intervene and investigate. An inspection of Crippen's home yielded no results. During an interrogation led by Chief Inspector Walter Dew, Crippen conceded that he had invented the tale of his wife's demise, citing embarrassment as the reason. He claimed that Cora had actually abandoned him and eloped to the United States with one of her lovers, a music hall performer named Bruce Miller. Dew found Crippen's explanation satisfactory. Unbeknownst to Crippen and Leneve, they were unaware of Dew's stance and were gripped by panic. Consequently, they fled to Brussels, seeking refuge at a hotel for the night. The subsequent day saw them journey to Antwerp, where they embarked on the SS Montrose, a Canadian Pacific liner, with Canada as their destination. The couple's abrupt disappearance prompted the police to intensify their search of the premises. It was during the fourth and final exploration that they unearthed the remains of a human torso, concealed beneath the brick floor of the basement. William Wilcox, later known as Sir William Wilcox, a senior scientific analyst at the Home Office, 
identified traces of the sedative scopolamine in the torso. Cora's identity was confirmed through a patch of skin from the abdomen, however, the head, limbs, and skeletal structure remained undiscovered. Her remains were subsequently laid to rest at St. Pancras and Islington Cemetery, East Finchley. Meanwhile, as the journey across the Atlantic unfolded aboard the Montrose, Crippen and Luniv adopted a discreet approach. In an attempt to evade recognition, Luniv disguised herself as a boy. However their efforts were thwarted, when Captain Henry George Kendall discerned their presence. Not wanting to let the chance slip away, just before the ship moved beyond the range of its wireless transmitter, Captain Kendall instructed the telegraphist to transmit a wireless telegram to British authorities that read, I hold strong suspicions that Crippen, the murderer from the London cellar, and an accomplice are among the saloon passengers. The mustache has been removed, revealing a growing beard. The accomplice is masquerading as a boy. Their demeanor and physique unmistakably indicate that the accomplice is in fact a girl. It's worth noting that had Crippen opted for third-class travel, he might have eluded Kendall's notice. Meanwhile, Chief Inspector Dew embarked on the faster White Star liner SS Laurentic from Liverpool. Arriving in Quebec ahead of Crippen, Dew swiftly established contact with the Canadian authorities. As the Montrose entered the waters of the St. Lawrence River, Dew, now disguised as a pilot, boarded the vessel. Given that Canada was still part of the British Empire, extradition proceedings would have been necessary if Crippen, an American citizen, had chosen to sail to the U.S. instead. Despite the circumstances, Dew's opportunity arrived when he invited Crippen to meet the pilots during their boarding. Removing his pilot's cap, Dew revealed himself and uttered, Good morning, Dr. Crippen. Can you recognize me? I am Chief Inspector Dew from Scotland Yard. Following a brief pause, Crippen responded, Thank heavens, it's come to an end. The suspense has been unbearable, I could no longer endure it. Subsequently, he extended his wrists, offering them for the placement of handcuffs. Thus on July 31, 1910, Crippen and Lunive were apprehended aboard the Montrose. The ensuing journey saw Crippen's return to the United Kingdom on the SS Megantic. Crippen faced trial at the Old Bailey under the jurisdiction of Lord Chief Justice, Lord Alverstone, commencing on October 18, 1910. The legal proceedings unfolded over a span of four days. The initial witnesses called forth by the prosecution were pathologists, including Bernard Spilsbury. Their testimony revealed their inability to conclusively identify the remains of the torso or determine the gender. However, Spilsbury did manage to locate a piece of skin containing what he contended to be an abdominal scar consistent with Cora's medical history. Notably, significant quantities of the poisonous substance scopalamine were discovered within the remains. Further investigation revealed that Crippen had acquired this substance from a local chemist prior to the murder. Crippen's defense asserted that Cora had actually fled to the United States in the company of another man named Bruce Miller. The defense sought to cast doubt on the timeline of events, contending that Cora and Holly had only begun residing at the house in 1905, suggesting that a prior homeowner might have been responsible for the placement of the remains. In challenging Spilsbury's assertion regarding the abdominal scar, the defense argued that what appeared to be a scar was, in reality just folded tissue. They pointed out that the presence of hair follicles growing from it contradicted the typical attributes of scar tissue. Additionally, Spilsbury's observation of sebaceous glands only at the ends but not in the middle of the scar was highlighted. The prosecution further introduced evidence that included a fragment of a man's pajama top, supposedly sourced from a pair Cora had gifted to Crippen a year earlier. Although the pajama bottoms were found in Crippen's bedroom, the top remained missing. This fragment bore the manufacturer's label, Jones Brothers. Alongside the remains, bleached hair consistent with Cora's was also discovered. A representative from Jones Brothers testified that the specific product had not been available for purchase prior to 1908, 
aligning the timeline with the Crippen's occupancy of the house, and the year Cora bestowed the pajama garment upon Hawley in 1909. Throughout the trial and during his sentencing, Crippen displayed no remorse towards his wife, demonstrating only concern for his lover's reputation. The jury swiftly reached a guilty verdict for Crippen's murder charge, taking merely 27 minutes for deliberations. In contrast, Leneve was solely accused of being an accessory after the fact, and was subsequently acquitted of the charges she faced. Despite the absence of a confession or a clear motive from Crippen himself, various theories have emerged attempting to explain his actions. One such theory was put forth by Edward Marshall Hall, a legal practitioner from the late Victorian and Edwardian eras. Hall believed that Crippen had been using hyacinth on his wife as a depressant or to reduce her sexual desire. In this scenario, he may have accidentally administered a fatal overdose, prompting panic upon her demise. Interestingly, it's noted that Hall declined to lead Crippen's defense, possibly due to an alternative theory that was to be presented. In 1981, a number of British newspapers reported that Sir Hugh Rees Rankin asserted that he had encountered Ethel Leneve in Australia in 1930. According to Rankin, Leneve disclosed to him that Crippen had murdered his wife because she had contracted syphilis. John Ellis conducted the execution by hanging of Crippen within the confines of Pentonville Prison in London, which took place at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, November 23, 1910. Subsequently, Leneve embarked on a journey to the United States before eventually settling in Canada, where she secured employment as a typist. Her return to Britain transpired in 1915, and she lived until 1967. Upon Crippen's request, a photograph of Leneve was laid within his coffin and interred alongside him. Although Crippen's burial site within the grounds of Pentonville Prison lacks a marked gravestone, Tradition holds that a rose bush was planted over his resting place shortly after his interment. Presently there is an endeavor underway by certain relatives residing in Michigan to advocate for the repatriation of his remains to the United States. In October 2007, forensic scientist David Foran from Michigan State University presented findings that challenged the identity of the remains discovered beneath Crippen's cellar floor, suggesting they did not belong to Cora Crippen. This investigation employed mitochondrial DNA analysis and genealogy to identify three living relatives of Cora, her great-nieces, who supplied mitochondrial DNA haplotypes. This DNA was then compared with genetic material extracted from a microscope slide, containing flesh taken from the torso discovered in Crippen's cellar. In addition, an advanced Y-chromosome assay was used on the original remains, revealing that the flesh sample on the slide was of male origin. The research team further contested the accuracy of identifying a scar on the abdomen of the torso, which had been presented during the initial trial as matching Mrs. Crippen's known scar. The researchers detected hair follicles in the tissue, a presence inconsistent with scars, a point that Crippen's defense had highlighted during his trial. However, the newfound scientific evidence questioning Crippen's guilt has met with skepticism and disagreement. Journalist David Aronovich, writing for The Times, voiced skepticism about the methodology used by the American team and their reliance on a single-aged slide for their findings. In response, Foran reaffirmed that the tests definitively established the remains' male nature. Blonde hair discovered in curlers at the crime scene is currently preserved in the Metropolitan Police's Crime Museum. Attempts to obtain samples from these hairs for DNA testing have been refused multiple times. While New Scotland Yard was willing to conduct hair testing for a fee, this offer was dismissed by investigators as excessive. Some researchers theorized that the police may have planted body parts and a fragment of the pajama top at the scene to implicate Crippen. This theory posits that Scotland Yard felt immense public pressure to apprehend a suspect for the crime. An independent observer pointed out that the case only garnered public attention after the remains were discovered. In December 2009, 
the UK's Criminal Cases Review Commission, reviewed the case, and concluded that the Court of Appeal would not consider posthumously pardoning Crippen. In the end, the tale of Holly Harvey Crippen fades into the mists of time, leaving behind a legacy of mystery that defies easy resolution. As the years roll on and the echoes of history grow fainter, we are left to contemplate the enigma that was Crippen and the web of intrigue that surrounded him. Was he a calculating murderer, or a victim of circumstance? The answers elude us, buried within the layers of history and the vagaries of human nature. The trial, the evidence, the theories, they all contribute to a complex mosaic of a life that played out in the shadows of uncertainty. As the final chapter of this true crime saga comes to a close, the whispers of the past linger, inviting us to contemplate the nature of justice and the limits of our understanding. <laughs>